It's great to be with you this morning. Let's turn together in our Bibles to John chapter 18. We're going to begin in verse 12, go down to verse 27. And if you want to find your place for just a moment in the sermon, I'm also going to go over to Luke chapter 22. You may want to put your finger there and just hold it. But John chapter 18, beginning in verse 12, I want to give you three lessons that we can learn in the midst of the darkness. This is a dark time. Darkness is set over the world, spiritually speaking, because the light of the world is being rejected. Uh, Christ has come, and having never done anything wrong, done everything right, yet in spite of that, he is being arrested and tried and taken to be crucified. That's where we find ourselves within this text. But very often we fail to learn lessons when we go through difficult times and dark days. But we don't want to make that mistake here. We're going to see that John takes us from inside a house to outside in a yard and back and forth. But whether you're in or out, there's darkness in both places. And it's just, um, it's a travesty what's happening and a tragedy. But nevertheless, there are things for us to learn here. So I've told you before, if all my points start with the same letter, it's a minor miracle. So I'm going to go ahead and just give them to you because um, uh, it makes me smile just to think about it. They all start with the letter F. And uh, here's what they are. Fight for fairness. Failure is not fatal. And follow with care. So let me read the text to you and we'll hit these three points. So the Roman cohort and the commander of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Anas first for he's, he was father-in-law of Caiaphas who was high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had accused, I'm sorry, advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. Simon Peter was following Jesus and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire where it was cold and they were warming themselves and Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the, in the temple where all the Jews come together. And I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, Testify of the wrong, but if rightly, why do you strike me? So Anas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again. And immediately, a rooster crowed. Three lessons from the darkness. And the first lesson is that we need to be fighting for fairness. Uh, in this day and time, there's a lot of talk about justice and social justice and things like that. And all the time, there's different examples of ways that people are being upset about things that they think are not fair. For instance, not too long ago, you saw where there were some very rich and influential people paying large sums of money to get their children into prestigious colleges. Most people said, that's not right. That's not fair. You're supposed to get in on, on your own merit. And just because your parents have a lot of money, it shouldn't make it so that you don't have to study and work hard to get into college. And a lot of people were really upset about that. 
A lot of people were really upset last year when a referee or an umpire didn't make a call in an NFL game and the New Orleans Saints missed the Super Bowl. In fact, the entire city just about didn't watch the Super Bowl in protest just because a call wasn't made. Most people would say, well, you ought to call it the same the whole game, call it fair the same way for both sides. And you see that in sports from Little League all the way up to the professionals. People want things to be fair. They want things to be just, and they want them to be right. There's all the times that we see in a fallen world examples of things that are unfair, things that aren't right, things that should be different, but they aren't. And so when you see Jesus on trial, you see another example of that. Here we see in verse 14 that Caiaphas had already advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. Now, how would you like to be arrested and taken away to be tried and the judge and the jury has already made the, pass the verdict against you before the trial ever even starts? That's the equivalent of what's happening here. The guy that's in charge has already said he's going to die. He's got to die. It's not very fair, is it? In fact, Jesus, when he's taken, he's taken first to Anas. Anas is like the godfather. <laughs> he, he, he's the ringleader. He's really the guy that's in charge. He, at one point, was the high priest, but he got deposed by the guy that was in charge before Pilate was in charge. But when he was taken off his, out of his position, at least four of his other sons held that position at one time, and now his son-in-law, Caiaphas, is holding the position. But Anas is the guy that's really in charge. In fact, the money changers in the temple, all that money they're making, he's getting a big chunk of that. He is rolling in money, and he is very rich. He's very powerful, and Jesus is arrested and carted off to be tried because they want to execute him because he's hurting the money, and he's hurting their power and their positions. After all, Jesus has just raised a man by the name of Lazarus from the dead after he'd been dead for four days. Now they need to kill Lazarus and Jesus. Things are just getting out of hand. They're worried the Romans are going to be upset and do something. I mean, they, they just need to put a stop to Jesus. So they bring him before Anas, the guy that's really the puppet master calling the shots here. And what does he do? He tries to get Jesus to implicate himself. He asks him about his teaching and about his disciples. Uh, he's trying to get him to say something incriminating. Uh, you know, in America, you don't have to incriminate yourself. We say it's not fair that you should be forced to say something about yourself that would hurt you. But it doesn't really matter in the Jewish court because anything anybody says can be overruled by witnesses. The Jewish people, the way that they thought and the way they acted, if you had two or more witnesses that would testify in agreement with, uh, against you about something, if their stories lined up, it really didn't matter what you said. You're going to be found guilty. And so witnesses were supposed to be put together, called together, before Jesus is ever arrested. You know, you think about in this day and time, an arrest warrant has to be issued for somebody that's going to be arrested. Probable cause has to be there. So you should have already had witnesses that would have testified against Jesus leading to him to be arrested. But there's no witnesses. There's no probable cause. What got the ball rolling here? Judas shows up, says, I can give you Jesus. And they start scrambling and putting things together and trying to, to, trying to make things happen. So now they've arrested Jesus from the garden. They brought him. It's very early morning. The sun hasn't come up yet. It's dark outside. It's cold. And Jesus, all he asked for is what? A fair trial. Where are the witnesses? Can we hear the witnesses that have something to say against me, please? I spoke openly in the public. Everything I've said, everybody knows. They don't have witnesses. And when Jesus only asked for the very thing that they call basic rights in the Jewish system for the witnesses to, to appear, he's hit in the face, isn't he? So they've arrested him without cause. They try to use every trick in the book to get him to incriminate himself. They've got no witnesses against him. He's been arrested illegally, and now he's under trial under somebody that's not even the person he's supposed to be in front of, but they're just trying to get him. Doesn't sound very fair, does it? You know, the idea about fairness, how we, how we should think about it, especially when we think about somebody else, we should think along these lines as what Jesus taught us. He said, you ought to love your neighbor as yourself. 
And when you see someone in a situation that seems like they're being mistreated or something's wrong there, what you want to ask is, what would I want somebody to do for me? How would I want somebody to handle the situation if they saw me in that situation? And if you could figure out what you'd want somebody to do for you if that was you, you start saying, well, this is what I need to do then. You know, because there's a lot of unfairness and un injustice in the world right now. People go to work and they should get a promotion they've worked hard for and they deserved it, but somebody else gets it instead. Or in their workplace, there's sexual harassment that goes on. And it's unjust and it's unfair that someone should be intimidated going into their workplace and have these sorts of feelings. And you'd want somebody to stand up and help you if you were in that vulnerable position. You'd want somebody to help you. And certainly if you were in a position of power, you wouldn't want to use your power in an unjust way against someone. Just because you have the ability to do something doesn't mean you should do it. When you see Jesus being treated unjustly, you know, it ought to resonate within your heart. This is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. But when we see something's wrong, we should fight. Fight for fairness. We should fight for our fellow uh, brothers and sisters to help them and fight for fairness throughout this world and try to make it so that things are as fair as possible. Again, there's always going to be some unfairness and things that aren't right. But when you see something that's very, very wrong, something like this, it's amazing that nobody stands up to defend Christ at this trial. In fact, now there's pr police brutality. I mean, how would you like it if you were in custody and the law enforcement officer is watching you slaps you across the face? And you haven't even said anything wrong. But see, what Jesus is facing here is just a foretaste of worse things to come. Anas, when he's confronted with Jesus by the fact that he's got no witnesses against him, is going to now dismiss him to go before the Sanhedrin and before Caiaphas. And eventually they'll try to call in witnesses and they won't be able to get the story straight. And so eventually Jesus is going to be asked a very simple direct question. I adjure you by the living God, they'll say to him. Tell us, are you the son of God? Jesus will say, I am. You said it. And for that reason, they'll have him killed claiming that it's blasphemy. Not asking whether it's true or not, but in their minds that'll be enough. So that's how the night is going to unfold. Completely unfair, completely wrong. Everything is going against Christ. But we need to be mindful that more unfairness exists in this world, and we need to be careful to be on the side of justice and on the side of uh, things that are right and not decide with those that are unfair, unjust, but before I move on, let me say one thing. There is a movement, it seems like, in Christianity to make social justice the number one thing. That is not the primary thing that Christians are called to fight for. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the primary message. And that's our primary mission, carrying that message to the world. And so we want to let the world know that Christ came, sent from God, that he is one of the three persons of God, having lived a perfect life as a man without ever ceasing to be God. And because he was man, he could die for us. Because man deserves to pay for what we've done. But only God could pay it. We needed the God-man. We need to tell the world that Christ, when he died, was dying as a substitute. That he was dying to pay our debt. He was going in our place. And that he has risen from the dead. And he is alive and coming again. And we will all stand before him, and the only way to be ready to meet him is to surrender to him as the Lord, King, Master of your life. That is what it means to believe in Jesus. I believe he's alive. I believe he's coming again. And I believe he is the only means of salvation. And if I believe that, that he is God, and I need to be ready to meet him, the only proper response is to fall on my face before him and surrender my life to him. That's what faith looks like. And so fight for fairness. Number two, failure is not fatal. Let's shift from Jesus to Peter for a minute. Peter's scared off three times. It's not really a crime to be a follower of Jesus. Not yet. But nevertheless, <laughs> he did cut off somebody's ear in a garden, so there's that. And he's seeing what's happening to Jesus, and I'm sure he's thinking, you know, by extension, that could very well happen to me. 
because he knows Jesus is being treated unfairly. And if they're not going to play by the rules and they're not going to play fair, if they'll do it to Jesus, they'll certainly do it to his followers. So G, uh, Peter's a little frightened here, isn't he? He's a little scared about what might happen. So three different times he denies Jesus. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by this. Peter shouldn't either. He'd been warned by Jesus. So I'm going to flip over to Luke chapter 22, and I'm going to go over this with you for just a minute because our next point is that failure is not fatal. And I want you to get in your mind some things to think about with this. Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Jesus is speaking to Peter, and he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. He says, Lord, with you I'm ready to go both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster's not going to crow today until you've denied me three times. Three times you've denied that you know me. Some thoughts about failure. It's going to happen. You're going to mess up. You're not perfect. Uh, there's going to be some times where you really blow it. But it's not fatal. It's not the end. Uh, Peter, I mean, he's the man, right? He's the one that was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. He saw Jesus transformed. He saw his divine uh, glory begin to shine. Peter has seen the dead raised. He's seen the blind healed so that they could see and, and the deaf hear and the demons cast out. He's watched Christ walk on the water. He's seen him feed thousands. He was there when Lazarus was called out of the tomb. And yet here now, he's scared off by a few people. You're one of his disciples, right? No, not me. Even cursing to deny that. Friends, you can walk on the mountaintop with God and you can have a lot of good spiritual experiences, but there may come some times when fear uh, and intimidation may come your way. And what will begin to happen is you'll forget about all that stuff that happened in the past. You'll forget about all the things God's done for you and all the ways that you've seen God work. And all you can think about is what you see right before you right now. And you'll start to want to do something to save yourself or watch out for yourself and it'll cause you to, to fall away and mess up. That's what happened here. Now, I want you to see in Peter's life some things that happened here. Number one, he, Jesus says, Behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you. You know sometimes that when you fail that there was a satanic work behind it? It's not just sometimes that you failed and, the, and it, there was nobody helping you out there. You, you might have had a little push. And the thing is, you might not have known it. The devil was at work not just to bring down Peter, but to bring down all of them. Now, he had to ask permission because he may be a lion or, or like a roaring lion, but he's on a leash. He can't do anything without God letting him. So this is a child of God, Simon. The devil says, uh, if you leave him alone, he'll fall. And God let him. So Satan demanded it. The point I'm trying to make is when you fall away, sometimes there may be a satanic influence going on in your life and you need to be aware that the devil is working and he wants you to fall and he wants you to fall away he wants to destroy you he will mess you up royally if he can number two i want you to see something else god knew he was going to fall before he did god let it happen in fact god even let the devil work in his life to bring him down didn't he satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat so he's demanding it from God, not that he can make demands on God, but he's asked for that permission or that right, and God let it happen. And now, obviously God had a plan. God had a purpose. God had something he wanted to accomplish in Peter's life, and without Peter failing, it wouldn't be there. Did you notice how Peter was bragging? Lord, I... Let me say it the right way. I, with you, I'm ready to go, to go both to prison and to death. He's pretty confident, wasn't he? He's pretty sure of himself. Maybe a little prideful, maybe a little arrogant. If everybody else falls away, that's fine, but I'm not going to do it. 
Maybe God had to knock a little something out of him. Put a little bit of humility in there. In fact, that night, Peter should have been praying and he was sleepy. He's so confident that his prayer life has fallen off. He feels like he can handle it. Whatever comes his way, he's the man, he'll take care of it. You know, a lot of times in failure, God can teach you some things that you can't learn when you're walking in victory. I think Peter learned a little bit about what it meant to, to be dependent on God and not try to be independent. How he needed to be surrendered and to pay attention to what the Word of God said as Christ spoke to him, and that was God's Word speaking to him. And he says, Peter, you're going to fall away. Satan's after you. Pray. Maybe he paid a little bit more attention after that. You ever learned anything through your failures? I have. I learned a lot. People may wonder, what, why did you take so long to get to a church this size? Because I had to be at a small church so I can make a lot of mistakes. You learn what not to do. I mean, really, that's how you grow a lot of times, isn't it? If you're not willing to make mistakes. I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about America is that in America, you can fail. Business people fail all the time. But in America, you can get back up again and get going again and try again and again and again. Failure is not fatal in America, and it's not fatal in Christianity either. Peter messes up royally here. But God had a plan. Part of God's plan was what? Peter, when you turn, restore your brothers. You see it in verse 32? When once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Do you know that part of what God teaches you in your failure is how to handle it? How to deal with it? How to get through it and make it through and to keep on going and to persevere? I mean, listen, Peter's not praying, but Jesus has been praying. Satan's after you, Peter. I'm praying for you, though. I'm praying your faith won't fail. Is that not the mark of a genuine believer? Whatever comes your way, even if you mess up royally, you persevere, you press on, you don't quit. Peter didn't fall away forever. He stumbled. He wept. He was broken. He thought he was done, but he wasn't. God's going to teach him something down there. And then when he gets back up, and the Bible says when he turns, when he repents, when he makes things right with God, he says, now I want you to go find your brothers. I want you to pick them up and help them get where they need to be. Do you know that in your failures and the things that you've messed up on and the ways that your life has not been perfect and things have not gone your way, that what God teaches you in those difficult times, there's somebody else going to be going through something similar to what you've gone through that's going to need the knowledge and the wisdom and experience that you've had. And you're going to have an opportunity to speak into someone's life and to help pick them up and to get them going again. And you wouldn't know what you need to know to help them if you wouldn't have gone through what you went through. And sometimes what happens with Christians is we, we mess up and we think, I, I'm done. You know, you start going to church, you're real faithful all the time. Then you go into your workplace one day and you get real angry and you say something you should have said. Maybe you spout off something and, and you just you wish you could have just grabbed it and shoved it right back in your mouth. But now it's out there and it's gone and it'll never come back again. And everybody's heard you and you think, I'm done. I've ruined my witness. I've ruined my testimony. You're not done. You know, things fall apart. The world's falling apart. You're not done. Failure's not fatal. If Peter can do what he did, deny Jesus three different times at the time when Christ would have needed him most. If God's not done with Peter, he's not done with you either. And, and there, there's going to come some times when the devil is going to work in your life and try to convince you, that's it, you're done. You're out of the game, bud. Give it up. Turn and walk away. Don't you quit. Don't you give up. God knew what you were going to go through before you went in there, and God loves you anyway. Jesus has been praying for you like he's been praying for Peter. Uh, he's your intercessor. So you persevere. You repent and you help others. Failure is not fatal. In spite of everything that happened, Peter got back in the game and God restored him. One more thing and then we'll have the Lord's Supper. Uh, we've heard that we need to fight for fairness. We've heard that failure is not fatal. And then last thing, follow with care. 
there's a couple guys in here that, that I could use this for. One would be Caiaphas or Anas, high-ranking religious leaders that were in their communities, uh, the people that you just couldn't get any higher than them. But in spite of all their religious um, their station, I guess is the word I'm looking for that I can't find, they were lost. They were on their way to hell. Anybody that would have been following them would have been following them down a road that leads to destruction. But that's not really where I want you to go, but, but I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, and I'll build on it in a second. The one I really want you to think about is Peter. Now, Peter's the number one guy, right? Peter? Simon, I'm going to change your name. You're the rock. On this rock, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom, Peter. I mean, he's the number one guy. And he fell away. He messed up. And so when I tell you follow with care, here's what I mean. There are people who you might admire, might be great Christian leaders, might truly know the Lord, that will mess up. And they'll mess up royally. And if you're not careful, it'll mess you up too. How many times have you seen, even recently, someone that was a very prominent Christian fall away, get into some kind of sin, and it destroys their ministry, it might destroy their marriage, it destroys their life. And you start to see people that were following them in a sense, maybe members of their church or something like that, and those people start to fall away. Uh, you might hear people say things like this, I'll, I, I'm done with it, I'll never go to church again, I, I'm done serving, and I'm just, I'm out. If that person can do that, I'm done with it. Follow with care. Now here's what I mean. There are people that are very, very godly Christian people. And they are following Jesus. You could learn a lot from these people. And it would do you good to follow them. But remember, you're following them as they follow Jesus. If they ever turn away from Jesus, you're not to be following them away from Jesus. You're to follow Jesus. And so if you're following after Jesus, if they turn away, it doesn't stop you from following Jesus. You keep going down the path you're going down. And so you can find someone else to learn from, someone else to help you to grow, someone else to minister in your life and to speak in your life and give you wisdom and help you to, to grow as a believer. But don't fall away because of someone like this. If you're following Caiaphas or Anas in this day and time, you're following somebody who's lost. You're following somebody who's not following Jesus. And, and they're, they're not going to help you. But if you're following somebody it is a Christian, and it could be that there's someone that you know. Maybe they're a deacon in the church. Maybe they're your Sunday school teacher. Maybe it is someone on the pastoral staff. There, there's a number of people that you might look to. And what happens if someone like that falls away and messes up? Well, it shouldn't stop you from serving Jesus at all. You should keep on keeping on. Uh, you, you follow with care. You say, I follow them as long as they are following Jesus. But if they ever stop following Jesus, I'm going to keep following Jesus. I'm just not going to follow them. And so that's where so many people are getting messed up today. Uh, you live in a fallen world, and everyone around you is sinful, and everyone has the potential of great destruction in their life should they embrace sin. And there are some things that people can do that will just absolutely ruin their lives. And you might know of someone whose life is self-destructed, just destroyed by sin that they commit. And it might be somebody that you admire greatly. I mean, I remember back in, I think it was the 80s or the early 90s, something like that, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, you remember them? I mean, that made national headlines, but you've seen people like that over and over and over throughout the years. And they just embarrass themselves and their families and they just... They, they just uh, do self-destructive things and it and it begins to spread around and yes it might cause a stain on the church and it might by, by maybe some extension feel like it, some of that's coming toward you or the church you belong to but listen you don't quit because it's not about what that person is doing it's about what you're supposed to be doing the only one that you can control is you so you stay faithful even if everybody else falls away 
You're going to have to answer to God for you. You don't have to answer for them. If you quit because of them, then you weren't following Jesus. And if you stay in, even if they fall away, then it is about Christ. That's why I tell people all the time, you don't come to church for the pastor. You don't come to church for anybody. You come for Jesus. And if you come for Jesus, it doesn't matter if the pastor's there or not. It's about Christ. It's about Jesus, Christ alone. You pray, you say, God, what church do you want me to be a part of? And God gives you a church to join, you go. You stay faithful, you don't quit. So lessons from the darkness. People are going to fall away. Follow Jesus. He's the one that went to a trial, was mistreated, treated unjustly, spat upon, slapped around, ultimately tortured and killed. He's the one that died in our place. And he's alive. If you ever mess up yourself, your failure is not fatal. It's not the end of the world. God can still use you. He's still got a plan for you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You follow with care. Your own fatal failures aren't fatal. And we'll fight for fairness, but we'll understand above all that the gospel matters more than anything. The gospel is that Christ died for you in your place to pay for your sin. He's alive from the dead. Anyone that will call upon his name can be saved. If you haven't done it, I invite you to do it today. Pray with me, church. Father, in the name of the Son of God,